Adam and Eve, Abraham and Isaac, Joseph and the coat of many colors, Moses and the Exodus, David and Goliath, Daniel in the lion's den, Esther and her commitment to stay the course. Who is the real hero of the scriptures? Could it be that from the beginning of time, the real hero, the bigger story all along was a savior, a Messiah, a Jesus that was to come and take away the sins of the world? What really is the big story? here this morning. So thankful. Um, and while they're making their way out, man, just a special thanks to, to, to you guys. I know that this, aren't, this isn't ideal conditions. I know some of y'all in the back, I mean, if you're like me, I would have been gone about 10 minutes ago. Um, we're all crammed in here and, and so thankful for that. While at the same time, I want to be aware that there are a lot of those that, that are super uncomfortable. And so, man, we are trying to do everything that we can to make room for everybody, but just thankful uh, for the grace and the mercy that y'all are showing us in this season of life where we're just trying to, 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 to deal with all this as we go. And so uh, keep that all in your prayers as well um, so that we can hopefully eliminate a lot of this um, in the days ahead. And so with that being said, I, I wanna start today off with just letting you know right out of the shoot that today is gonna be weighty. Um, we're gonna talk about sin. Uh, we're gonna talk about sin that we are oblivious to. We're gonna talk about sin that we just continue to kick dirt over. Uh, we're going to talk about things that a culture swims upstream to. Um, we're going to talk about end times, the rapture of the church, seven-year tribulation. We're going to talk about some weighty stuff today. And I say that to say this, that the church has become a, a sad place, really, where we can't talk about these things anymore. Um, what happens when we bring up hard-to-talk-about subjects in the church anymore is you get this pendulum swing, and you get two sides of it. One side of this, when you preach a message like today, will be those who will never come back to this church. And their reasoning is, it's too fire and brimstone. Um, it's for grandma's church. Uh, it's for the old school religious people. Uh, it doesn't apply to our world today. It was just a little too hardcore for me. I like graceful Jesus, loving Jesus. I don't like all this other stuff. That's one side of the camp. The other side of this camp is gonna elevate me on a pedestal that I should never be put on. This idea of, Man, preach, that's why we come out here, because you preach the truth, and you don't dodge the truth, right? There's that side of the camp. And really, both sides of those, it's really a sad tragedy that this has become the church. But because used to, when you look out throughout history, there used to be a day where the church embraced the hard to talk about scriptures. That there was a moment in the story of church where we didn't dance around the scriptures because we believed the word of God to be true. Even the stuff that we didn't like, even the stuff that convicted us, we embraced it. We liked it. In fact, in fact, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 18, Paul to the churches of Thessalonica, he says this, encourage each other with these words. Listen, that was following this pointing to the rapture of the church. He's talking about the rapture and how God's going to meet us all in the air. In verse 18, he's going, hey, and encourage each other with these words. But we don't do that. Why? Because we're so scared of what's going to happen if we stand on truth. What if people don't come back to our church? What if we get blasted on Facebook? And so we dance around it. We'll just go to the cutesy scriptures. We'll just go to the stuff that's easy to preach. It's a sad tragedy that's happened in our Western world today. And so with that being said, I feel like I need to give a disclaimer right off the top before we ever get into this, but it's important to know what this disclaimer is and what this disclaimer is not. So we'll start with what this disclaimer is not as we jump into this morning. I want you to hear me loud and clear that this disclaimer is not ever me apologizing for the word of God. I will not ever stand on this stage ever again and apologize for the word of God because I did it several weeks ago and I had to repent. There was a moment where we were talking about church government, and I made the comment, I said, I'm sorry if this bores some of y'all. And I'm gonna tell you, I got home and my spirit got checked. Of the Lord just going, who are you to apologize for me? Who do you apologize for my word? You just another preacher coming and going, right? And I had to stand in this place of repentance, and I'm thankful for people like Cassie Click, who also walked alongside me in that and going, hey, don't ever apologize for the word of God. And I vowed to the Lord that day, I will never stand on this stage and apologize for his word ever, ever again. 
Now, will there be moments that we preach messages that may not apply to you from the Word of God? Yes. Will there be moments that we preach from the Word of God that may bore you and you sleep through the whole sermon? I'm seeing a few of y'all every Sunday do that, so yes. Will there be moments that the Word of God convicts you of your sin? You bet there will be. Will there be moments of the Word of God that will convict your sin so much that you blast me on Facebook because you thought it was from me? Yes. And why I'm off social media now? You bet there will be. Will there be parts of the word that swims upstream to a culture that we don't like? Yes. But I will not ever stand in this place and go, I'm sorry that the word says this. No, why? Because I believe the word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-double-edged sword. It doesn't need my help, it doesn't need our help. Listen, we all just another generation coming and going and this thing's gonna keep going, right? And so we stand on the word of God. I will not apologize for that. But what this disclaimer is before we get started this morning, because this is weighty, is I want you to hear this from me this morning. It's all coming from love. All right, please hear me in that. I hope that I have proven myself in these eight years that a a couple of things, I love the Lord with everything that's in me. I mean, I hope y'all know that about me. Like my life wrung out is a deep, deep love for the Lord. I love him with everything that's in me. The second thing that I want you to know, and I hope that I've proven myself to you, is a deep love and a desire for the Word of God. I do love the Word of God. And because I love the Word of God so much, all of it, even the stuff that's hard to preach, that the greatest thing that I could do in love is as, as a dad, as a husband, as a pastor, as a friend, is point people to all of the truth. Right? Not dance around it, whatever applies to you, but that, that in then this act of love, the greatest thing that I can do is point y'all to truth from the Word of God. But just know that that today, all of this is coming from that place. More times than not, I'm preaching to myself than I am ever preaching to you guys. So please hear my heart in that. Don't leave here today thinking that I'm one of them old fire and brimstone preachers where I'm throwing my Bible at you and acting like I got all my life put together. I'm not. Please don't take it that way. I say this all the time, most of the messages are for me. If nobody else gets anything out of it, the Lord's speaking right to me. And so please know as you leave here today, it's coming from love, and it is the greatest thing that I could do in love is to point y'all to truth, even if you never come back to this church, even if you blast me on social media, even if you throw the note under my door, even if any of that stuff happens, I'd be doing an injustice not to stand on the truth from all of God's word. And it's all in love. So whatever the Lord does with it from that point on, between you, that's between you and the Lord. So do whatever you feel like you got to do, all right? So there's a disclaimer. We're going to jump right into our next story. So I want us to, if you were here last week, we, we've been kicked out of the Garden of Eden. Y'all remember Genesis 3, Adam and Eve did the very thing that God told them not to do. And so God has banished them from Eden. So we're all standing outside of Eden. And we've all slapped Adam across the face because now we all got to pay for it. And so we're getting in our time machine, and I want us to travel 1,656 years into the future. And in our time machines, we're traveling along this journey, 1,656 years. We're going to run headfirst into a guy by the name of Noah who's building a boat. If you've grown up in the church, you just know as the story of Noah's Ark. But it's important to know that, that as we get out of the time machine 1,656 years after Genesis 3 and we meet this man, Noah, man, it is a bad, bad time in world history. Things are not good. Genesis chapter 6, the first eight verses will tell you just how bad this world is. It is so bad that God's looking from the heavens above his creation and he can't find any righteousness other than this dude named Noah. And he finds this guy named Noah, and he gives him these instructions. Hey, I need you to build this ark because we starting over. I'm wiping everybody off the map. There ain't nobody righteous. Everybody's living like this and that, and you're the only one that's left on this planet, and so I need you to build me a boat. And so Noah does just that, but it's important to know as we understand this story, he didn't get the boat built that night. This would be a 120-year journey. 120 years. I mean, you talk about faith. I pray about some. If I don't see an answer in a week, I'm like, where are you, God, right? And, and Noah's like, I got you, God. I got my hammer. I got my saw. I got my nails. We're ready to go. 120 years before this thing that God told him was going to happen was going to happen. But God was faithful to do what he said he was going to do. Noah builds this ark. God sends this flood that floods this planet. And we know this to be true. I mean, you can walk out here on this hill 
and, and find some kind of fossilized something from the ocean pretty quick, right? Why? Because there was this moment where all of this was underwater. And Moses, I mean, not Moses, Noah takes two by two these animals into the boat, and they're on this boat for 150 days. And at the end of this 150 days, Noah sends out a dove. The dove doesn't return, showing Noah that there must be land now that's showing and the boat docks, and the door opens, and everybody walks out of the ark, and the Bible story continues. And if you don't know this story, maybe you're here today and you're new to the faith, I want to encourage you this week, man, get you a Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we got a Bible to give to you in the back. Those blue Bibles, take one. Those are yours for you to keep. But I want you to open up your Bibles this week. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 28 to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 29 is the story of Noah. What I just told y'all was just an overview of the story of Noah and his ark. But I want you to not just leave here and take my word for it. I want you to go to the word and I want you to read Genesis chapter 5 and verse 28 to Genesis chapter 9 and verse 29. That's going to be the moment that Noah was born and the moment that he died and everything else in between. So I want to encourage you to go home and read that. If you're in a small group, um, let that be your reading plan this week. Um, But I'm going to warn you, you're going to see an attribute of God that we don't talk a whole lot about in the church, all right? And we're going to address some of that here today, but I want you to go home and read it. Do not ever take me to be the gospel. Don't ever take me to be the word, all right? Go home, read it. It's about four chapters, a lot of really cool stuff in that. But I, I would venture to bet that for most of us, when we hear the story of Noah and the ark, our minds don't go much deeper than those coloring book images that we've been talking about. Some of these that will be on the screen here this morning. When, like me, if you like me, I grew up in the church. When, when I think of Noah in the ark, that's about as deep as my mind's ever gone. Y- y- y'all tracking with me? Like the elephant hanging out, right? Like everything's just great. You got the monkey hanging off the end of the, the boat. I mean, everything is good, right? Uh, there's another image that'll come on the screen here. Something like that. Um, everything's so colorful and pretty, right? Uh, I like the ones like before the... The, the flood ever comes and the big rainbows in the back. I'm like, your theology's terrible, whoever did this, because the rainbow didn't come up till after the fact. But nonetheless, when we think about Noah's Ark, that's about as deep as our theology goes to this story. We remember it from BBS. We remember it from when we were a little kid growing up, or maybe we've heard someone talk about it. But at the end of the day, we don't think much deeper than the coloring book images that have been engraved in our mind. Rarely do we talk about the death and the destruction that followed Noah's Ark. um, rarely do we talk about the wrath of God that was poured out on sin. We just don't talk about that, right? And so my hope and my prayer today is that that we can get deeper. We can get deeper than those images. And we can begin to see what really is the story of Noah and his ark. And what we're going to see today is it was never about animals prouncing into the ark. It was never about the rainbow, It was never about this giant boat that he made and all the specifics that God gave Noah. It wasn't how many days that they were out on um, the sea while this storm came. It wasn't about any of that. In fact, we're going to see today, it really wasn't even about Noah. Like Noah was faithful. Noah, Noah was a champion of our faith. But the story of Noah and his ark was never really even about Noah himself. And so then we beg to ask, what is it about? And what we're going to see today is the story of Noah and the ark It's about a a God who's wrathful against sin. Okay, can I just say this? God still hates sin. And we've gotten away from that in our world today, haven't we? Oh, well, Jesus is here. Guess what? He's the same God as he was then as he is now, and he still hates sin. He despises it. And it's about the story of God's wrath being poured out, yes, on the sins of Noah's day. But, but the, the bigger story is a wrath that will be poured out on sin once and for all on a Savior named Jesus Christ. While at the same time pointing us to another day that's coming. Check this out, church. Another day that's coming when that door is going to be closed forever. You see, the story of Noah and his ark isn't about Noah and the animals. The story of Noah and the ark is about you and about me and about us and about these times that we live in today. And we know this from Jesus' teachings. Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 39, Jesus himself, our Savior, says this. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. He's talking about when he comes back. For as 
in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. This prepositional phrase is one of the saddest in the New Testament. And they were unaware until the flood came. They were unaware. They failed to see it, right? And swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. So Jesus is going, look, when the days start looking like Noah's days, you better have your bags packed because I'm coming back. I'm coming back. You'd better be ready. Which begs to ask then, what were the days of Noah? And again, those first eight verses of chapter six, you, you don't have to read between the lines to say that things were bad. It was a world that was morally bankrupt. It was a world that, that was entrenched in sin. Nothing was off limits. Everything was permissible. Even the things that God detested, nobody cared about. When, when Jesus is referring to in Matthew's gospel about this marrying and giving each other in marriage, he's not talking about daddy walking down his bride, down his, his daughter down the aisle and handing her hand over. No, he's going, look, they just made a free-for-all for everything. That they were just marrying anybody that they wanted to. And when you got tired of that one, you just go get you another one. And when you got tired of that one, you can just go get another one. And if you got them, you don't like them too, you can just go get however many you want. Nothing was off limits. There was multiple partners. There were same sex. There was recreational sex, no boundaries. The commentators would, would, would refer it to days like Sodom and Gomorrah, if you grew up in the church and you know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which we're going there in the days ahead, Lord willing. But the days of Sodom and Gomorrah where everything was detestable to the Lord and yet nobody seemed to care. Sound familiar? So I want to say this, and this is going to be that part where I said the rest of this talk is going to be in love. I want to say this unapologetically. We are living in the days of Noah. We are. Whether we want to grab a hold of that or agree with that, that's between you and the Lord. But we are living in the days of Noah. How do we know that? Because you can step about five miles away from our world and see that real quickly. You can stand five miles away from the church and see that, bro. We've got people in this very family of faith that, that are shacked up with boyfriends and girlfriends and no desire to get under the covenant of what God calls marriage. We don't. We don't think it's a big deal. Why? Because our world don't make a big deal about it. Premarital sex that has infiltrated our churches, leaders in our churches, it ain't a big deal. Oh, we're quick to point our finger at all the other sins. We, we love to get up here and talk about abortion and all the other ones while we're shacked up with our girlfriends and our boyfriends and ain't nobody talking about it. Why? Because our culture has just become okay with it. It ain't a big deal. We're oblivious like the people of Noah's days. We don't even realize that we're wrapped up in sin and God detests it. It's sexual immorality that he speaks against time and time again. And we just turn a blind eye to it because everybody else is doing it. It's a fact, man. Again, this is all in love. I see some people doing the head bob at me. It's all in love. But, but let's keep just going. Let's, let's point to all of them, as much of them as we can. Did you know in today's time that the, the latest statistics would show that from 16 and under, one in three kids have had sex? One in three. When you got four kids, listen, there's an angst in that. If you got little ones, you're like holding them tight right now, aren't you? One in three under the age of 16 have already crossed lines. But let's keep going. We've got human life that has been disposed of since the Roe v. Wade verdict in 1970. Millions of little babies disposed of mainly out of inconvenience. Mainly out of inconvenience. Human life disposed of out of inconvenience. We've got men shacked up with men and women shacked up with women. It's completely normal and okay. You can't speak against it. You can't say anything about it. Again, this is all in love. Listen, we are living in a time, I thought about this this week, if I'd have gone back to the 1950s and told my pampa the things that are going on in our world today, he'd roll over in his grave. If I were to go to my pampa and go, pampa, you ain't gonna believe what's happening in 2023, guess what? You get to decide what you wanna be. He'd go, you got to, what? You get to decide what you wanna be. Even though God has put a part on you, you get to decide you don't want that part and you can be with the other one. You have that right. You get to be whatever you want to be. Let's go a little deeper. There are, there's a generation, a younger generation right now that are identifying as animals called furries. We laugh, it's reality. Guys, it's reality. 
I mean, we're laughing. Why? Because it's absurd to think about it. But there are kids that are barking at each other because they want to be a dog. The Imago day, God has created us in his image and we're barking at each other. We're meowing at each other. We're wearing the little things on our head and the tails because we want to be a cat instead of who God created us to be. It's an atrocity that's in our world and we just continue to turn a blind eye to it. We go to places and we don't even know what bathroom to use anymore. Y'all there? Like, I don't even know what bathroom to walk in anymore. You walk in, you're like, whoa. That wasn't supposed to be happening in the bathroom, but it's happening in the bathroom now. Because that's the world that we live in. And we just turn a blind eye to it. And we sure ain't going to talk about it. But let's keep going. Pornography. Pornography is wrecking our families. It's wrecking our marriages. Statistics would show that a large amount of men and women in this room, listen to me holler at you, are wrapped up in it. And marriages are completely unraveling because of it. Because you bought into some lie that this is what sex is supposed to look like. And you bring that into your marriage. And because he ain't doing that, and because she ain't doing that, then you're calling it off. And you're looking for something you're never going to find. It's feeding a monster that's completely out of control in our world and in our churches today. But ain't nobody talking about it. We sure ain't going to talk about it. But let's keep going. The sex slave industry. Man, just do some research on that. Pull up the end movement and look at the millions of little boys and girls treated like savages at the expense of this sexual fantasy that we're trying to find. At the expense of somebody's sons and daughters all over our world. We should be heartbroken over that. I say this all the time. So every click, every download, every picture that you look at is feeding the monster of these little boys and girls being treated like savages. And we're just okay with it. Hey, it's your world. It's just this YOLO mentality. Ain't hurting nobody. I'm just looking at this picture. No, you are feeding a monster with this little boy and little girls being treated like a savage. And we just keep turning a blind eye to it. Child molestation. Did you know it's on the increase in a way right now that it's completely out of control? One in five girls will be molested in her lifetime. One in 20 boys, and that number is skyrocketing. Some analysts are saying that in the years ahead, that'll be something that's completely okay and normal. It's a tragedy that's all over our world and infiltrating into our churches. But let's just keep going. Let's make us all uncomfortable a little bit. How about idolatry? Well, I don't worship any idols. Bull, because statistics would show you that this has become our golden calf. And there's men and women and husbands and wives all over our nation, all over our world, where we are worshiping our phones. We care more about what's going on out there than we do in our own family. And because of it, marriages are falling apart and kids are falling apart and kids are being raised up in fatherless homes because all we care about is what's looking at us in the screen. Idolatry is rampant. We fail to talk about it. Don't want to offend nobody. Let's just keep going. How about all the little boys that can shave? Y'all tracking with me? All the little boys who can shave. What I mean by that, those that, oh, they wanted to do the deed, but they didn't want to keep being the dad that they were called to be. And so we got a bunch of grown men that are acting like little boys. They got their heads set on, and they're playing Fortnite with a bunch of nine-year-olds while their marriage is completely unraveled. But we ain't saying nothing. It's okay. It's your world, man. Just play your game. You ain't hurting nobody. Are you kidding me? Be punted on any kind of responsibility that God has called you to, to be the man that God has called you to be, to be the husband that God has called you to be. You care far more about either playing games or chasing some American dream, whatever that is, that's all going to go away at the expense of everything. And what's happening because of that? Fatherless homes. Do research on fatherless homes. So now we got a bunch of little boys who become little boys who can shave. Why? Because that's all they've ever seen. They've never seen a dad go, look, I'm going to love your mom the way that Christ loved the church. I'm going to be the man that God has called me to be. We don't see that anymore. we got fatherless homes all over our nation, and then we wonder why our world's hell in a handbasket right now. But ain't nobody going to say nothing. Why? Because it's offensive, and we may hurt somebody's feelings. Now listen, I am so thankful for the mamas that are here today. I am, and those that are watching online. I mean, we just handed out roses because we're like, yes. But you know what the sad reality? Women are running our churches right now. And I'm thankful for it. I'm not saying that. Don't, please don't send me that email or do the head bob at me. That's a great thing, man. Great mamas in this church. My mama being one of the greatest mamas. I mean, I put her on a pedestal. That poured Jesus into me. And some of y'all are going, look, I'm here because mama. So I'm not discrediting the mamas, but I will say this. It was not God's design. 
It's been fractured. Now, where the ideal is lacking, grace abounds. Thank the Lord. But it was never, mama was never called to be mom and dad and doctor and nurse and coach and all the things that she's been called to be. It was never God's design. Are they stepping into that and killing it? You bet they are. But it wasn't God's design. It's been fractured. And while we got our headsets on playing Fortnite with nine years old, we're neglecting the things that God's called you to, man. And that's going on all over our churches and nobody is saying anything. So let me say this again. These are the days of Noah. And we, like Noah in his day, when we stand against these things, we've become the minority. I can feel the angst right now. I'll be deemed a racist. I'll be deemed a bigot. I'll be deemed a hate monger. I'll be deemed all these things, even though God detested in the scriptures because I've stood up against these things and just called a spade a spade, I'm gonna be canceled. Canceled. We live in a canceled world, don't we? We don't like it, I'll just cancel you. And here's the scary reality, that mentality is infiltrating its way into the church. We're getting canceled in the church for standing on the truth and the word of God. We're getting canceled, even though God detested. And the default is this, well, I just wanna be more like Jesus. And this is what I say to that, I do too. But check this out, Jesus hated sin too. He hated it, he despised it. Nowhere in Jesus' teachings do you go, hey, woman at the well, just keep hooking up with all your boys and keep doing your thing. Come follow me. What does he say to all of them? Go and sin no more. He hated sin. He had to die for it. He hated it. He wasn't okay with it. He didn't kick dirt over it. He overturned the tables of sin. But it has become our default in the church because we're so scared to get canceled. And so preachers are dancing around it and we ain't talking about it. Oh, we'll stand on the word of God of all the stuff that we like and we accept, but it's hard to stand on the word of God of that stuff that makes us a little mad. And so we just dance around it. In Genesis chapter seven and verse 16, it says a sad, sad thing. It says that, that after Noah had built this ark, it says that God closed the door of the ark. That stood out to me all week this week that God in his sovereignty closed the door of this ark, a, a, a door that was open for 120 years. Hey, come, the flood's coming, the rain's coming, storms are coming, a door that was open for 120 years. We need to know, church, that there is a day coming when that door is gonna be closed again. And this isn't out of fear, this isn't trying to scare you from the word of God. There is a day that's coming when that door is gonna be closed, check this out, forever. And unlike Noah, we ain't gonna get off in 150 days. It's it. And I think there should be angst in all of our hearts right now. Because who of those people in our circle that we deeply, deeply love will have the door shut on their face? How many of us in this space right here listening to me holler at you about these times so wrapped up in the things of this world, you can honestly say in the deepest part of your heart, that door is gonna shut in my face sad and scary if that's your story and so then the million dollar question that we've got to be able to ask and answer is how do we respond then in these days of Noah if we're going to hold Jesus to his word and going hey look you better be ready people are meowing at each other it's about that time how do we respond then and to help answer that is to go to the word of God Hebrews chapter 11 if you have your Bibles I want you to turn with me there Hebrews chapter 11 if you've grown up in the faith, you know that Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of fame of faith. And what I mean by that, the writer of Hebrews takes it upon himself in Hebrews chapter 11 to kind of pull the curtain back and point us to all the patriarchs and matriarchs of our faith. Those in the Old Testament who stood their ground. Those in the Old Testament who didn't waver when things got tough. Those in the Old Testament who were canceled. Those in the Old Testament that were rejected. Those in the Old Testament that were persecuted and some even killed but those who endured by faith. And you'll see this throughout the whole chapter in seven verses into Hebrews chapter 11, we see our character Noah put on a platform. And Noah on this platform, we're gonna see how he responded in his days. And it's this verse that I want us to look at under a microscope today, Hebrews chapter 11 in verse seven that says this. It says, by faith, Noah, being warned by God, concerning events as unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. 
By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Notice verse 7 starts and ends the same. Did y'all see that? By faith, Moses, uh, Noah was, I want to say Moses every time. So if I say Moses, just go with it. Um, by faith, Noah got this word from the Lord to build an ark, and he did it. And by faith, he was considered righteousness. And so will be the story of every character in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, Abraham. By faith, Sarah. By faith, Isaac. By faith, Jacob and Joseph. You'll see that in every one of these characters, which leads us to our first takeaway in verse 7 and how we can respond in these days of Noah. If you're taking notes, please do. Please discuss these in our small groups this week. Number one, Noah's faith was in what was unseen and not what was seen. In other words, Noah didn't wait on the thunder clouds to get there and the lightning to start happening. He didn't wait on that God-awful national weather alert noise that comes on your radio. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Don't y'all hate that thing? Like, I get anxiety when I hear that deal. Like, ever since I was little, I mean, you hear that and you're just like, oh, God, it's the end of the world. Like, you would think with all the technology today, this is just a side note, all the technology today, like literally, I mean, we got technology where you can like watch your family in Brazil on the phone, and yet when a national weather alert comes on, it's this horrible noise, it's ear piercing, and it sounds like a dude down in a bunker speaking through a can. You can't even understand him. You're like, what did he just say? I don't know, but I think we're all about to die, so we're all hiding under our tables, right? I'm like, come on, man, we need to step up our media game when it comes to this national weather alert. But nonetheless, Noah didn't wait on that. He didn't wait on the thunder to come. He didn't wait on the lightning. He didn't wait on the storms. In fact, we saw it a while ago. 120 years would go by. Man, we can't miss that. 120 years, not minutes, not hours, not we're talking over a century before he saw this thing that God called him to do. But by faith, by faith, Noah took a step to prepare for the wrath to come, even though he couldn't see it. And so we've got to be able to ask ourselves, is that our story? Is that your story? Is that my story? Are we prepared for the wrath to come? Because again, if we're going to believe this to be true, all of it, not just the good stuff that makes us feel good, but all of it, even the stuff that makes us uncomfortable, may, may, you may not ever come back here. Are you preparing for the wrath to come? We've got to be able to ask ourselves because on today's news, I mean, just go home today, I challenge you, even Fox News, turn on the news. In about five minutes into any newscast you decide to listen to, it is hell in a handbasket out there, isn't it? I mean, it is chaos all over our world today. I get anxiety just watching the news, so I don't watch it anymore. Somebody will say, hey, do you hear? We're like into the world apocalypse. I'm like, no, I didn't even hear because I'm not watching the news because I get anxiety and I want to take up drinking again. And so I just don't look at it. I don't even listen to it. But it's, it's reality. In our world today, we've got nation rising against nation. We've got wars and rumors of wars. We've got natural disasters like we've never seen before, earthquakes and hurricanes, weather patterns like we've never seen before. We've got nations locking arms with other nations that will make your hair stand up when you start thinking about it. I mean, we're like, if those two come together, it could be bad, and we're seeing that play out right before our eyes. We see a cashless economy coming. We see world order coming. We see events going on in Israel right now that should make your hair stand up. Why? Because God's been warning us from the very beginning. Hey, when you begin to start seeing these sayings, you had better look out. And yet the church continues to be a sleeping giant. Can we just call it for what it is? We know all of these things to be true. We've been warned of all of these things and the church in the Western world has continued to be this place where a guy in skinny jeans gives you all the stuff that makes you feel good and we leave here and we don't think about God again until next Sunday. We've become a place of entertainment. We've become a place of rock stars, laser light shows, all of those things failing to see that the thunderstorm clouds are rumbling outside, bro. The national weather alert's going, take cover. It's here. The days are here. And we just keep coming in our churches, being oblivious to what's going on around us, even though God has warned us time and time again. You see, Noah didn't have that. All Noah did was have a step of faith and going, hey, one day God's going to do this thing while I build this boat. But God gave us something better. He's going, when you start seeing A, B, C, D, E, F, and G happening, you better be ready. And we're seeing all of these things happen. And yet we just keep coming in here and making church silly in a place of entertainment. And we, like the people of Noah's days, have become oblivious to what's going on all around us. 
even though the Bible is full of divine warnings of a door that's gonna forever be closed. Did you know that in the New Testament alone, just the New Testament, of 244 chapters of the New Testament writings, 318 references of Jesus coming back for his church. Like this isn't something we just, he just kind of mentioned, bro. 318 references. Hey, there is a day coming. One of those is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17 that says this, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. The rapture of the church. And we talk about that in the church. We're preaching that to a bunch of believers because we're like, oh, I just can't wait till Jesus comes back and we just get to meet him in the air. And that's awesome, man. I can't wait for that day because I know I'm gonna meet him in the air. We'll be like, yeah, I'm ready for that day. But we gotta get underneath that and go, yeah, but what about everybody else? What about all those people you're too scared to share this with? But because if I believe 1 Thessalonians to be true, I gotta believe the Daniel prophecy to be true and the book of Revelation to be true, that it's gonna be hell on earth for those that are left behind. I know that's not popular today, but it's reality if we're holding God to his word. Read the Daniel prophecy, a seven year tribulation that I wouldn't w wish on my worst of enemies. I mean, yeah, we're gonna be in the air with the Lord, but there's gonna be people that we deeply love that will be left behind. And that should give us all a burden and an angst. In fact, you can read some of this stuff in Revelation. Revelation 16, four, Revelation 8, 8, talks about how the seas will turn to blood. A third of the seas will turn to blood. That in itself would wig everybody out. Like y'all see, we were on a cruise and everything turned red. But it just keeps going. Revelation 9, Five, I thought of my daughter, Kinley, when I read this one. If you don't like bugs, you better start saying your prayers right now. Because Revelation chapter 9 and verse 5 talks about demon-like locusts, bro. Demon-like locusts that sting like scorpions for five years. That'll make somebody repent right there, won't it? Kinley's like, amen, amen. Demon-like locusts. That's from the Bible. Man, that's not something I'm trying to scare you with. That's straight from the Bible. We ain't going to do a VBS over that, are we? But it just keeps going. I mean, it talks about the, the gates of hell literally being open to humanity. The mark of the beast just to be able to survive persecution like we can't even fathom or wrap our brains around. And then that's not even the end. Then there's the second coming. Zechariah warns us about it in his prophecy in chapter 14, three and four of this second coming, this time where Jesus is coming back for his church. And this will be the final deal breaker. And it'll be in this moment that all of us, even those that shot the Lord the finger, their whole lives are gonna be standing before him as they open up the Lamb's book of life. We see that in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12. And the names of those will be read, those that put their trust and faith in Jesus will spend eternity with him. And it talks in Revelations how God will split the people like he splits uh, sheep and, and goats. And those names that were in this book will enter into eternity. And man, we champion that and we celebrate that. But there is a day coming and we don't talk about the three verses later that says those names who weren't called were cast into the lake of fire. Well, that's just too fire and brimstone. It is what it is. That's straight from the word of God. And so if we believe Revelation 12 or 20 and verse 12 to be true, then we need to believe Revelation chapter 20 and verse 15 to be true, that many of our loved ones will be thrown into a lake of fire. That should burden us. That should keep us up at night. Daughter, what can I do to be a voice to that? And that will be the moment that that door closes. Check this out. Forever. Forever and ever. And it's either going to be with him in eternity or eternity in torment. That's from the scriptures. And so let me ask again. In faith, are we preparing for that day? We gotta be able to answer, ask and answer that question. Number two, the second takeaway from 11.7 is this, and we've been talking about this over the past several months, Noah feared the Lord. Now this isn't a fear like, oh, I'm so scared. Um, it's not the fear like the enemy gives us. It's not like the fear of people that we get sometimes, but it's like this reverence, this awe kind of fear, this, oh my Lord, oh. I mean, I can't even stand on our feet kind of fear. This was Noah. God, you want me to build a boat? I'll do anything you want. How big and when you want it by? 
Why? Because you're big and you're holy. And if you say a flood's coming, then a flood's coming. So I better start building. I better get my hammer out. I better get my saw out because I believe that you are holy. It's an understanding that he's not our homie, but he's a holy, holy, holy God. And Noah got that. And we see this all through the scriptures. Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So it's important to know that when we read the story of Noah, this is the fear that drove Noah to do what he did. And this fear ultimately saves the life of Noah. When you really look between the lines, it was this fear that saves his life. Noah was motivated by fear, and this is not a bad thing. I think fear gets a bad rap in their church. Well, I'm just going to not have any fear. Now, there's a difference. We need to have this awe and reverence of a holy God. And this is a fear that I'm talking about. It's a God-given attribute that he's given all of us, this self-preservation kind of mindset. So let's say I go to the doctor today, and the doctor tells me, hey, you got cancer. But we caught it early enough, one round of chemo, going to knock it out, and you're going to be good. What am I going to do? Well, I'm just going to go home and pray about it. Yeah, I'm going to do that, but I'm going to go get some chemo. Why? Because there's this fear and reverence and awe of what I know cancer is going to do to me if I don't take action and do something about it. You see, God's given us that. That's not a bad thing. That's not lack of faith. God has given us this self-preservation. Um, if I go to a lawyer and the lawyer's like, hey, you screwed up, and if you don't do A, B, C, and D, you're going to jail. What am I going to do? Well, I'm just going to pray about it. No. Yeah, I'm going to pray about it while I do A, B, C, and D because I don't want to go to jail. Why? Because there's a respect. There's an awe of the law. Hey, you don't do it, they're going to lock you up. And I've been there, don't want to go back. So I'm going to do whatever I got to do. If I'm going to go cross the street, I don't stand at the edge of curb and go, you know what, God, just get me through to the other side. That's ignorance. And had, we've just taken this approach in the church, right? Well, you just don't have enough faith. No, I'm not an idiot. And I'm going to stand at the edge of the curb, and I'm going to look this way, and I'm going to look that way, and then I'm going to look back this way because I'm old and slow, and I want to make sure i got plenty of time. And that doesn't mean that I've got lack of faith or I didn't love the Lord enough. It's because I don't want a bus to run over me. I don't want a bus to run over me. Why? Because I've got a fear and a reverence and an awe of what's coming at me. And I'm no match for it. I've hit a deer. I see what it looks like when they don't have a reverence for it. And I don't want to be the deer. And so this is a good thing, guys. We've got to get out of this mindset that fear is all from the devil. It's a, there's a difference. In fact, in a spiritual sense, it's a great thing. And Jesus shows us this in Matthew chapter 10, how this fear drives us to take action. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, he says this, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. So that's talking about that other fear, right? The people are going to blast you. The people are going to talk nonsense about you. Um, all that other stuff that we can, oh, I'm just so scared. That's what Jesus is talking about here. But he's going this, but rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body and hell. So now he's pointing us to a fear that we need to have of a holy, holy, holy God. Fear that. Fear that. Have a reverence and an awe to God. We have got to get back to this place as a church. We're missing this in the bride of Christ anymore. He's become our homie and not holy. No, he's a holy, holy, holy God. And Noah got that. Noah's like, you want me to build a boat? Show me where the hammer is and I'll start working right now. Because I know that you're big enough to say that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. And then the third and final takeaway. And I think this is probably the biggest one of all of them that we miss. Noah obeyed the instructions that the Lord had given him. The Lord didn't just go, hey, build a boat, see ya. He gave him instructions. I want it to look like this and be like this and it's gonna look like this and you're gonna build these levels and he gave him instruction. And check this out, church. God has given us instructions. He's given us instructions as well. And I wanna look at four of these real quick and then we're out of here, I promise. Things that must become a part of our story as we prepare our lives for these days of Noah. Number one, we make Jesus your Lord and your Savior. Number one, right out of the chute. Not church behavior, not I'm cleaning up my life, I'm not as bad as I used to be. I used to be this wild honky tonkin' rodeo dude over here. I used to cuss a lot. Now I come to church with my girlfriend, I don't cuss near as bad as I used to. Not good enough. Now you make Jesus your Lord and Savior. And I put Lord and Savior because another sad tragedy that's happening in our church is we're okay with them being Savior, but not our Lord. We want this get out of hell free card, right? Oh yeah, I don't want to go to hell. I believe in Jesus. 
One, two, three. Everybody look at me. Everybody looks at you. Our way, we're good. And then we just live life however the hell we want to live. That's not what this is about. Jesus as your Lord. Listen, when Jesus comes back, he's coming back, yes, as your Savior, thank the Lord, but he's coming back as your Lord. And we've lost that in our church, man. We just want this. I just want to get out of hell and keep living the life that I want to live. That's not salvation. You've bought into something that's not reality. And hell will be full of a lot of people that said, yeah, but I said this thing. I said this thing. And he's going to say, depart from me for I never knew you. In fact, I love this quote. A.W. Tozer, A. W. Tozer wrote this about this. He says, to urge men and women to believe in a divided Christ is bad teaching. For no one can receive half of Christ or a third of Christ or a quarter of the person of Christ. We are not saved by believing in an office nor in a work. He is Lord. And those who refuse him as Lord cannot use him as a savior. Everyone who receives him must surrender to his authority. For to say we reject his right to reign over us is utterly absurdity. It is, it is a futile attempt to hold onto sin with one hand and take Jesus with the other. What kind of salvation is it if we are left in bondage to sin? So let me say again, to prepare for these days of Noah is to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. John 10, 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. John 3, 18 talks about um, the condemnation that's gonna come for those that have not put their trust and faith in Jesus. He is our only way, the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. So that's number one. Number two, I love this. We are living our lives for that day and not today. Capital letters, that. We're living for that day. That day of 1 Thessalonians chapter four when he blows the trumpet and we're standing in his presence. We're living our lives for that day and not today. The church is, is ugly sometimes. I'll say that all the time, but I'll also say the church is a beautiful thing. You know why it's beautiful? Because we all got something that the person next to you ain't got. And God is doing something in you. He's made you for such a time as this, for the people in your circle, for things in your life that I'll never be able to infiltrate and be a part of. He's given you gifts. He's given you resources. He's given you abilities. He's given you marriages. He's given you kids. He's given you grandkids to properly steward, right, for that day. He's given all of us that thing. I was reminded of this several weeks ago and my friend Stan. Stan shared his testimony on a video. Um, Stan was one of those stories that he came in right when I needed Stan to come in. It's just a faithful reminder that God's still in the business of saving people. And Stan literally went from living like this, now to living like this. And so he shares his testimony and a handful of people show up to church that Sunday. And check this out, handfuls of people that we've been praying for for years to come to church. Never darkened the door of this church. You know why they were here that Sunday? Because of Stan, because Stan had a story to tell. Stan had a testimony to tell that I couldn't get into. I couldn't do anything about that, but Stan could. And Stan was able to tell his story and it brought people to hear of a God who saves through the story of Stan. You were made for such a time as this. And there will be a day, the scriptures will show us that there'll be a day that we're rewarded for these things. If you've been a part of our Bama seat, it just illustrates you so beautifully. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 10 through 15, and Haley can start making her way up here, we'll close. I love this scripture because this is gonna be what we do with those things that God has given us. It says this, because of God's grace to me, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it. But whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful for no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. So he just pointed us to number one. Anyone who builds on the foundation may use a variety of materials, gold, silver, jewels, wood, hay, or straw. But on that judgment day, and this is a judgment day after the Lamb's Book of Life, right? This isn't like heaven or hell judgment day. This is what you've done with these things that God has given us. But on that judgment day, fire will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. If the work survives, that builder will receive a reward. But if that work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved, but like someone barely escaping through a wall of flames. 
so it's important to understand that in this text, what Paul is pointing us to is there's a day that's coming where we're gonna be before Jesus. And he's gonna fly over our life and go, I gave you this, and I gave you this, and I gave you this. I gave you Melissa as a wife. I gave you Kenley, Brody, and Kendall, and Garrett. I gave you those grandkids. I gave you the ability to play the piano. I gave you the ability to speak and preach my name. I gave you the ability to be a friend to the people that nobody else wanted to be a friend with. What did you do with what I gave you? And in that moment, the fire is gonna burn up anything that I made my life about me. The American dream, the houses, the cars, the stuff, all of that's gonna be burned up. But those things that God gave me, that he entrusted me with, are gonna be refined in that fire. And he's gonna hand me these jewels. The, the, the scriptures go on to talk about these crowns that will, some of us will receive, the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, the crown of life. And we'll receive, we'll receive these crowns and these jewels and these things that God has given us for properly stewarding that stuff that God gave us. But then it gets better. It says in Revelation that there's a day coming when we get to take all of our crowns and we get to lay them at the feet of Jesus in this ultimate act of worship. And I don't know about you, church, and maybe you're just completely content with bringing your little gumball crown and go, Jesus, we good, thank you. But I don't know about you, I want an arm full of crowns. I want so many crowns that my neck is crooked and I want them up my legs and I want them all around me so that when I get before Jesus, I can just lay them at his feet and go, you are worthy of it all, God in this ultimate act of worship. And yet how many of us are living our lives with nothing more than this on that day of judgment? Because of all the things of this world were so important to us that we failed to live for that day. Our focus was on nothing more than what was right in front of us our whole lives. It's a tragedy. No, we live for that day, not today. And I'm gonna tell you, when we live for that day and not today, it changes everything. It's gonna change how you love your spouse. It's going to change how you pursue this American dream and all this stuff. It's going to change how you raise your kids and your grandkids. It's going to change how you wage war against that sin when we're living for that day and not today. Number three, not only are we living for that day, but we're ready for that day every day. That's a lot of days. We're ready for that day every day. Our bags are packed. We're ready to go. That day ain't going to be someday because that someday could be today. But we're ready for it. And the Bible time and time again warns us to be ready. Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the ten virgins. And he tells these ten virgins to do this thing. And it says in this parable there was five foolish virgins and there was five wise virgins. Guess who the wise ones were? Those that were ready for the bridegroom to come back. Guess who the foolish ones were? Oh, we good. He'll come back someday. And he came back and they weren't ready. And Jesus is the one telling the story. He goes on to say in verse 13, be ready. From the lips of our Savior, be ready because we do not know the day or the hour. Revelation 16, 15 talks about him coming back like a thief in the night. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be the next day, but nonetheless, we got our bags packed, ready to go. And I don't know about you, but I'm ready to go. I'm ready, man. I can't wait. I cannot wait for that day. And if you can't wait for that day, there might be a heart check that needs to happen. Because it could just be, man, you're more interested in the things of this world than you are that glorious day that's coming when all of this will be no more. And then lastly, go and tell. Go and tell. We talk about the one we love. And this is the great commission given to us even by Jesus himself. Go and tell. I love the revelation that Richard Bovey has had lately of, you know, you've heard that quote about, you go out and preach the gospel and when necessary, use words. Richard's like, no, we gotta use our words, man. We gotta talk. We gotta tell people of the goodness and mercy of what God has done in our lives. The woman at the well didn't just go in the community and go, okay, I'm not gonna say nothing. They're just gonna tell. No, what did she say? Come and see the Christ who told me all I ever did. Now we go and tell if we believe that to be true, we go on and tell them. We're talking about it. Will the people reject us? Yes. More than not, probably. 
I can tell you more rejection stories than I can salvation stories. But check this out. That's okay. Why? Because I ain't God. Somebody asked me the other day, does it bother you that nobody ever comes down the front? It used to. But now I'm like, hey, that's between you and the Lord. I ain't God. And it's not my business to save anybody or to manipulate feelings so that people get saved. All I can do is go talk about the Jesus who stepped into my story and changed my life from the inside out, and he wants to do the same in you. I'm going to go tell everybody that I can, and I'm going to scream Jesus all the way to my death. Why? Because I believe it to be true. And so I ask again, by faith, are you prepared for that day? Are you prepared for that day? Maybe you're here today and you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe just hearing that, man, you feel the angst in your heart to go, look, I remember 30 years ago saying some prayer, but my life has always looked the same. I've had no desire to follow him, no desire to live my life for him. And the spirit of the living God is just convicting your heart right now to go, I'm lost and I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. There's gonna be some men, some women up at the front that wanna have a prayer, a conversation, answer questions, whatever that might be. I pray that that would be someone's story, that nobody would leave here and that be their story because we don't know when that day is going to be. We don't know when that door is going to close forever. But maybe you're here today and you're guilty of being a part of this sleepy church. We've just become oblivious to everything that's going on around us. And man, can we be convicted of that? Can we allow repentance to fall on this place and go, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that just like the people of Noah's days, I've been oblivious to it. I failed to hear the thunder that's been rumbling and the alert that's been going off because I've been so entrenched in the things of this world and the pursuit of the things of this world. I need to repent of that. I need to lay it down at your feet. Can we allow the Holy Spirit to do that in our hearts today? And can we be the church, bags packed, living for that day and not today? In these days of Noah, can that be our story? I'm going to tell you, we become a force to be reckoned with when this becomes our story. I'm going to end with this scripture and pray we're out. Ephesians chapter 5, 10 and 11 says this, wake up, wake up sleeper, rise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, Paul says, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word, even the hard stuff. God, is, I've just been in this weird angst all week of nervously excited to preach this message because I know where we can stand on your word and your word alone. And I'm not responsible for anything else. All I can do is preach it and point people to it and trust you to do the rest. And God, that's my prayer today, just trusting you to speak to us, to speak over us, to allow your Holy Spirit to fall over us, to run out any guilt, any condemnation, any of that other stuff. Lord. Maybe some of those sins that I called out earlier, maybe we're wrapped up in those things, we're right in the middle of it. But instead of hearing that as guilt and shame and condemnation, God, would you allow us to open our hearts to that conviction? And would you allow us this space to be able to lay that stuff down at the feet of Jesus? Can we get out of this mold where we can, we're too afraid to talk about the hard stuff and rather be encouraged to talk about the hard stuff? And so Father, what, whatever's going on in our hearts, I pray, Holy Spirit, would you just fall on this place? God, would you remind us that there's a glorious day that's coming? Yeah, it could be 50 years from now, but it could also be today. And I pray that we're just challenged to ask ourselves, God, are we living for that day? Are we loving our spouses for that day? Are we raising our kids for that day? Are we loving each other for that day? And God, where we're not, would you just so convict our hearts of that this morning? God, if there would be a soul that doesn't know you that's here today that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, God, would you reveal that to them today? God, we invite you to come. Holy Spirit, would you fall on this place? Would you show us, Lord, how we can fix our eyes back on the author and the perfecter of our faith? 
the midst of all the distractions, God. So we love you. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we ask it all in Jesus' name.